Thank you, everyone. It is now 30 minutes after the hour, and we will reconvene the session to begin our um, discussion on pneumococcal vaccines. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kathy Paling, who is chair of the pneumococcal vaccines work group, for an introduction and overview of today's session. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the pneumococcal vaccines discussion. Next slide, please. Um, a special thanks to all members of the pneumococcal vaccine work group. We've had a ton of conversations, and a special thanks to my co-ACIP member, Sarah Long, all the ex officio members, our liaisons and consultants, and a special thank you to Mwako Kobayashi, our CDC lead. Next slide, please. In addition, we'd like to thank all the CDC contributors, our great and ETR consultants who provide enormous amounts of information so that we can make um, scientifically based dis uh, discussions and decisions. Thank you. Um, I want to remind you and um, get a refresh of where we are. So big picture, pneumococcal vaccines are currently recommended for use in the United States. For adults, we have the 15 and 20 vaccines that are recommended. For children, we currently have 13 and 15. And with that children's vote, the PPSV23 vaccine is a risk-based recommendation for children. In adults, um, the PPSV is for those who previously received 13 or are, are receiving 15, but not for those receiving 20. And so this is some of the differences. And the goal is to move forward and make fewer differences. Next slide, please. All right, so as a reminder, all children under the age of two have the same pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. It's three primary series and a booster often known as the three plus one schedule. Um, the primary series is at two, four, and six months, and the booster is at 12 to 15 months. Right now, either PCV13 or PCV15 can be given for US children. Next slide, please. All right, children with certain underlying conditions are recommended to receive PPSV23. So for healthy children, that is not true. But for children with chronic medical conditions, CSF leak, cochlear implants, um, after the conjugate vaccine, eight weeks to a year later, um, PPSV23. And for those with immunocompromising conditions, it's the same. And then five years later is a second dose of PPSV23. For children, um, six to 18 years of age with chronic medical conditions, they can receive PPSV23 if they do not get a pneumococcal vaccine, conjugate vaccine. All right. All right, so um, approval of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine 20 use among children is anticipated later this year. Currently, um, it's February 2023. And we anticipate later in quarter two, 23, that the pediatric PCV20 will be approved. Remember, we've already re approved the pediatric PCV15 in June 22. All right, we are considering the following two questions. Should PCV20 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently sched recommended schedule dosing um, for children aged less than two years of age? And should PCV20 without PPSV23 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal vaccination for ch U.S. children aged 2 to 18 years of age with underlying medical conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal conjugate disease, Pneumoco yeah. risk of pneumococcal disease. Next slide, please. So today, we're going to have several presentations. We're going to hear about the epidemiology of pneumococcal disease in, among U.S. children, the pediatric outpatient ARI visits, and antibiotic use attributable to serotypes in higher valency pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, PCV20, phase 2-3 study results among children, 
preliminary ETR for evidence to recommendation for PCV20 use in children. And then um, the work group considerations and next steps. With that, I'm ready to turn it over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paling. Uh, next, we'll introduce Dr. Ryan Gierke, who will um, speak about the current epidemiology of pediatric pneumococcal disease in the U.S. Uh, good afternoon. We'll begin with a background on the spectrum of pneumococcal disease. And pneumococcus is transmitted through airborne droplets from person to person. It can colonize the nasopharynx and can be spread locally to the ears to cause otitis media. It can also be aspirated and cause pneumonia. Pneumococcus can also infect the blood and cause septicemia. These different infections can be characterized into either non-invasive disease shown above the red line or invasive disease shown below. Invasive pneumococcal disease, or IPD, is a less frequent but severe form of the illness. Non-invasive disease is more frequent, and in children, otitis media is one of the most common forms of pneumococcal disease. Note that pneumococcal pneumonia can be either invasive or non-invasive, depending on if a sterile body site, like blood, becomes infected uh, in addition to the lungs. Today we'll review recent IPD data looking at the impact of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, or PCVs, and IPD incidents and the serotype distribution. We'll examine IPD incidents caused by serotypes covered in the new conjugate vaccines, PCV15 and PCV20, and changes in IPD incidents and serotype distribution resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also review the impact of PCV13 and incidence estimates among acute otitis media, or AOM. We'll then review what we know to date on the impact of PCV13 on all cause and pneumococcal pneumonia in children, as well as recent estimates of pneumonia incidence. We're going to first look at the impact of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines on pediatric IPD incidence and serotype distribution. Data on IPD are obtained from the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance System, or ABCs, which provides population-based surveillance at 10 sites across the U.S. Cases are defined as pneumococcus isolated from a normally sterile site in residents of the 10 surveillance areas, highlighted on the map in blue. Isolates are serotyped at reference laboratories using whole genome sequencing, quelling, or PCR. And for analysis purposes, serotypes are grouped by vaccine types. U.S. Census Bureau estimates were used as denominators to calculate incidence rates for overall and serotype-specific IPD and are presented as cases per 100,000 persons. This graph shows incidence rates of IPD among children under five from 1998 through 2019. Before introduction of conjugate vaccines in the U.S., incidence rates of IPD among children less than five, shown on the graph in blue, were around 95 cases per 100,000 persons. And PCV13 type IPD, which is shown in orange, caused the majority of disease. Also note here that we include 6C as with the PCV13 serotypes due to cross protection provided from the 6A antigen included in the vaccine. After introduction of PCV7 in 2000, rates of IPD declined significantly, with additional declines in disease following PCV13 introduction in 2010. After around 2013, declines in PCV13 type IPD rates plateaued at around less than two cases per 100,000, and this trend has continued onward through 2019. Rates of overall IPD are now less than 10 cases per 100,000 persons with much of the remaining disease caused by non-PCV13 serotypes. This is the same graph, but focusing on more recent years from 2007 through 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic resulted in a 50% reduction in rates of overall IPD in 2020, compared with 2018 and 2019. However, in 2021, rates began to rebound with a 30% increase compared to 2020 rates. 
data for 2022 are not yet finalized, but looking at 2021 data by month, around, um, after around August of 2021, the monthly rates of IPD were back to the pre-pandemic levels. We examined IPD rates for individual serotypes and PCV13 among children less than five from 2011 through 2021. The serotypes in the original subvalent conjugate vaccine are grouped together in gray, except for 19F, which is shown in yellow. After PCV13 introduction in children, rates of IPD declined for many PCV13 serotypes. However, reductions were not seen in serotype 3, which is shown in green, or 19F. And together, both of these accounted for almost 80% of remaining PCV13 type disease in 2018 and 2019. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic led to a change in the serotype distribution of PCV13 type disease. And in 2020 and 2021, serotype 19F rebounded quickly and now accounts for the majority of remaining disease, while the proportion caused by serotype 3 has declined. We'll continue to monitor this to see if these changes continue. Now we'll review the uh, current pediatric IPD burden among PCV15 and PCV20 serotypes. This table shows the serotypes contained in the three different conjugate vaccines and PPSV23. Serotypes covered by PCV13 are shown in yellow. Additional serotypes covered by new conjugate vaccines, PCV15 and PCV20, are shown in green. PCV15 contains the 13 serotypes included in PCV13, plus serotypes 22F and 33F. And for analysis purposes in the preceding graphs, we'll refer to these two serotypes as PCV15, non-PCV13. PCV20 contains the 15 serotypes included in PCV15, plus an additional five serotypes, which are 8, 10A, 11A, 12F, and 15B. We will refer to these five serotypes as PCV20, non-PCV15. Finally, there are four remaining serotypes unique to PPSV23, shown in orange, and we'll refer to these as PPSV23, non-PCV20. This graph shows incidence rates of IPD among children less than five grouped by vaccine type from 2011 through 2021. Rates of PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes shown in orange and PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes shown in gray had remained relatively stable in recent years before the COVID-19 pandemic. And although rates of IPD were lower in 2020 and 2021, PCV15 non -PC, uh, PCV15 non-PCV13 and PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes still account for a similar proportion of IPD at around 15% each. Here's the same graph for children aged 5 to 18 years old. Please note here that the y-axis is different from the previous slide due to lower incidence among older children. There's greater variability in rates of IPD over the years in this age group, likely due to having much fewer number of cases. A note here that IPD has not started to rebound in 2021 as we observed in younger children. Children with immunocompromising conditions are at increased risk of IPD. These graphs show rates of IPD among children with select immunocompromising conditions. The blue bars indicate rates of disease among children with the condition, while the orange bars note rates among children without the condition. And please note the y-axis is on the logarithmic scale here. Among children less than five, on the left graph, those with a hematologic malignancy had rates of IPD around 230 times higher than children without a hematologic malignancy. African-American children with sickle cell disease had rates of IPD at around 30 to 70 times higher than African-American children without sickle cell disease, depending on their age. 
And although it's not shown on this slide, I wanted to point out that among children with immunocompromising conditions, a higher proportion of IPD is caused by non-vaccine serotypes compared to children without immunocompromising conditions. Next, I'll review the impact of PCV13 on acute otitis media and review available data on incidence estimates from AOM. AOM is a major cause of childhood morbidity, and pneumococcus is a common cause of AOM, accounting for around a quarter of bacterial AOM. Studies have shown that AOM incidence has decreased after PCV13 introduction, with declines ranging from 11 to 14%, depending on the age groups and the years examined. This table shows recent estimates of AOM incidence per 100,000 person years among children from various studies. Note that the incidence of AOM is much higher than that of IPD. AOM estimates vary among studies, but incidence is consistently highest among children less than five years of age. And serotype specific estimates for AOM will be covered in the uh, following lecture given by Ms. King. Finally, we'll review the data on the impact of PCV13 on all cause and pneumococcal pneumonia, as well as estimated incidence of pneumonia in children. Multiple studies have shown reductions in all cause and pneumococcal pneumonia among children following introduction of PCV13. Reductions in all cause, pneum all cause pneumonia range from 17 to 35% among children depending on the age group with reductions largest among children less than two. And there was an estimated 40% reduction in pneumococcal pneumonia among kids less than one year of age. And a 51% reduction in pneumonia among kids age five to 17 years old. Here, we summarize all-cause pneumonia and all-cause inpatient pneumonia incidence estimates, again in cases per 100,000 person years among children. Pneumonia incidence is lower than AOM incidence, but higher than IPD incidence. And again, the highest incidence is observed among children less than five years of age. And also again, serotype specific incidence estimates for pneumonia will be covered by Ms. King in the next presentation. In conclusion, the use of PCVs has significantly decreased the incidence of pneumococcal disease in US children. However, risk of disease remains higher in children with immunocompromising conditions compared to those without. In 2018 and 2019, the proportion of IPD caused by vaccine serotypes was around 15% of IPD for PCV15, non-PCV13 serotypes, and around 30% of IPD for PCV20, non-PCV13 serotypes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, and this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Lear. Could you please go to slide 22? You're comparing the incidence between immunizing com immunocompromising conditions. Is that pre-vaccine? Is that after the, the vaccine has been introduced? Oh, the, the, the years you mean are, are among the individual this is for years 2015 through 2019. So, oh, sorry. So it's, uh, it's more recent data after vaccine introduction. So it's even after vaccines, we still have a very high differential. Correct, right. Thank you. Dr. Long. Okay, her card is down. Um, I might have different slide numbers, but were you, just the last couple of slides, I have slide 18, but that's probably not right. It's, um, oh gosh, slide oh, 28, yeah. maybe? Add nine, add slide 27. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're too good at math, Dr. Lair. Um, can you just clarify for me uh, why you think there's a differential for the two to four year age group, why uh, it seems protective for the young and the older kids and not as much for the two to four year olds? So, um, yeah, I think it might just be that um, the, you know, the, the studies look at different um, 
code, there's a lot of variability in these studies with the age groups, so the, the numbers might just have been too small. I think there was a downward trend, but it was not found to be significant. It's probably just the amount of children included. Yeah, thank you. Maybe at some point, either uh, later in this presentation or um, afterwards, if you can, I think I can see the references on the slide, but I, it would be great to review that data. Thank you. Okay, sure. Dr. Sineas. Thank you for that presentation. Could we go to slide eight? Uh, do we need to add um, 17? <laughs> uh, so I'm just asking for a clarification. Um, in this slide, it shows that the incidence of IPD among children less than five years old, uh, the majority of uh, the cases are from serotypes um, 19F and three, which are in all of the vaccines. Is that correct? Uh, so, so just to clarify, so this is looking specifically at uh, PCV13 type disease, uh, mm -hmm. but 19F was included in both vaccines. It was in PCV7 and PCV13. However, serotype three was only introduced in PCV13. Thank you. So those cases are still high despite the vaccines. Is that correct? Uh, the, yeah, they, they've um, serotype three has persisted. We haven't noticed a, a change in that serotype. And 19F, um, while it did go down significantly after PCV7 introduction in recent years, it's rebounded, rebounded, but um, just a little bit. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Do we have any further breakdown of the children less than five um, who, where we saw the drop and then the rebound? Uh, in terms of the... In, immunization information. Oh. Uh, um, just wondering if the pandemic might have... Um, yeah, I, um, oh, around 2020, I see. Yeah. Um, there was a slight dip right, in, um, in vaccine rates. We, I presented that uh, last year at the um, looking at data, I think it was through 2020, and there was a slight dip, but we had not updated that for 2021, so we can, we'll go back and review that also. Um, and do you anticipate, uh, this is, sorry, this is Grace Lee, uh, do you anticipate any more data from 2022 to come in? And part, part of the reason I ask is because I feel like I saw more complicated pneumonias this winter than any other winter, and it was a combination of pneumococcus, you know, group A strep, staph, um, often with a co-infection due to viruses like flu, RSV, and COVID. So I'm just curious uh, if you'll, you'll be able to also accumulate some additional data from this winter. Um, it might not show up under IPD. It might show up under you know, inpatient pneumonia, for example. I just don't know how okay. to be classified if they're co-infected. Uh, yeah, we did try to look at that, but unfortunately the, the data wasn't complete, especially for the, the latter part of the year. So. Uh, but we could also look at just uh, pneumonia, not just IPD as well. But we should have, um, we are working to have updated 2022 data on IPD. Thank you, and Dr. Kobayashi? Uh, thank you, um, I just wanted to add that, you know, we also tried to look at another surveillance system, National um, Notifiable Control Disease that. Surveillance um, Syndrome, um, surveillance, excuse me, and then DSS. Uh, so that's voluntarily reporting, so they have its own limitations, but then the trend was, you know, during this past, uh, fall, um, there was an uptick in the um, IPD cases reported for children under five, so definitely there is a trend, but um, it's, you know, both surveillance has its own limitations, so we'll continue to follow that. Sorry, I was trying to pull it, I did have a slide, but now um, I was trying to pull up slide 42, but let me see if I can, oh, okay. Yeah, this was the um, NNDSS data that uh, Dr. Kobayashi had mentioned, and you see it, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to, especially in the, the end of the year. Um, so the blue line is, or the, oh, I guess it got, sorry, it got cut off a little bit, but I believe um, the yellow is, um, is the 2022, yeah. And so you see that it, it did increase, but like um, for December data, we don't think that all of that has been reported yet, so we could see further increases. So right now we're, as far as we can tell, it's still similar to what we've observed in uh, 2021 and before the pandemic. 
Thank you so much. Any additional questions? Okay, I believe we will move on to the next presentation by Ms. Laura King on pediatric outpatient ARI visits, uh, acute respiratory infection. Sorry. I hope I got that right. Acute respiratory illness visits and antibiotic use attributable to serotypes in higher valency pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. Great, thank you. I'm happy to be here today to present results from our study estimating pediatric outpatient acute respiratory infection visits and antibiotic use attributable to serotypes and higher valency PCVs. Next slide, please. These are our disclosures. Next slide. And briefly, here's what we'll be covering today. Next slide. Acute respiratory infections account for a large proportion of all outpatient visits and antibiotic prescriptions in children. In previous work looking at a commercially insured population, we established that there were over 1,200 1, visits for acute respiratory infections, abbreviated ARIs, per 1,000 children in 2018. And in a separate study, we established that there are about 250 ARI-associated antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 children issued from U.S. doctor's offices and emergency departments per year in 2014 and 15. Streptococcus pneumoniae is a known etiology of several ARIs, including acute otitis media, sinusitis, and pneumonia. However, the contribution of pneumococcus to the total burden of these conditions and the visits and antibiotic prescriptions associated with them is still unknown. Our time series, next slide, please. Our time series data do demonstrate decreases in outpatient visits and antibiotic use associated with pneumococcal conjugate vaccines or PCVs. Here we present a graph from a previously published study showing the number of all antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 persons stratified by age group. Among children represented by the blue, green, and light orange lines, the rate of antibiotic prescriptions decreased from 2011 to 2014, coinciding with uptake of PCV13 after its introduction in 2010. This decrease was especially pronounced in the under twos, shown by the blue line, the age group eligible for vaccination. As we consider PCV20 and PCV15 for pediatric use, we need to better understand the potential impacts of these higher valency vaccines on outpatient visits and antibiotic use. Next slide. And this was the impetus for our current study. Our overall study objective is to estimate the incidence of pediatric outpatient visits and antibiotic prescriptions for acute otitis media, sinusitis, and pneumonia caused by streptococcus pneumonia serotypes found in the new higher valency PCVs, PCV15 and PCV20. We focus on the additional serotypes in PCV15 and PCV20 that are not in PCV13 to quantify the additive potential of these vaccines. We'll call these serotypes PCV20-13 and PCV15-13 serotypes. We focus specifically on acute otitis media, abbreviated AOM, sinusitis, and pneumonia, as these are ARIs with established pneumococcal involvement. Our overall study objective is composed of two parts. First, we estimate the incidence of all cause visits and antibiotic prescriptions for these conditions. And second, we estimate the proportion of outpatient disease caused by PCV15-13 and PCV20-13 serotypes. Multiplying the results from these two components will give us the incidence of visits and antibiotic prescriptions for these conditions attributable to PCV15-13 and PCV20-13 serotypes. Next slide. So I'll begin with the first project component, all-cause visit and antibiotic prescription incidence for AOM, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Next slide. We use two different data sources to capture visits and antibiotic prescriptions across all outpatient settings in the US. We estimated visits to and antibiotic prescriptions from physician offices and emergency departments using the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, NAMPSIS, and the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey in HAMSIS. These are nationally representative surveys administered by CDC's National Center for Healthcare Statistics. We used 2016 and 2018 data as later years in 2017 were not available in HAMSIS at the time of the analysis. Because NAMSIS and HAMSIS only cover physician offices and EDs, we use the market scan claims databases to estimate visits and prescribing in alternative outpatient settings such as urgent care and retail health clinics. 
In both data sets, a single diagnosis was assigned to each visit using an established tiered methodology that prioritizes diagnoses most likely to result in an antibiotic prescription. We standardized all incidence estimates per 1,000 person years at risk, and then estimated total incidence by taking the sum of the estimates from NAMSYS and HAMSYS and market scan. Next slide. Using those methods, we estimated that total incidence of outpatient visits for all three conditions was 208 visits per 1,000 person years, and total incidence of outpatient antibiotic prescriptions was 181 prescriptions per 1,000 person years. And you'll notice that the overall incidence was driven mainly by AOM. Next slide. And now I'll move on to the second component of the project and discuss estimating vaccine serotype attributable proportions and incidence. Next slide. So there are several major challenges in evaluating pneumococcal and serotype specific contributions to outpatient disease. First, children are frequently colonized with pneumococcus. Published estimates of nasopharyngeal pneumococcal carriage range from 11 to 60% in healthy children from high income countries. Second, samples from infection sites are not regularly obtained for outpatient pneumococcal disease. There are, however, some studies using samples of middle ear fluid in children with AOM, and we'll discuss these later. However, the children sampled in these studies often have severe or recurrent disease. And finally, little recent data exists for non-AOM ARIs. Next slide, please. And now I'll talk about how we approach these challenges and share our results, starting with AOM. Next slide. Because of the challenges I mentioned previously, we used three different methods to estimate the proportion of outpatient AOM attributable to PCV15-13 and PCV20-13 serotypes. All of these methods have their own limitations and no one method is likely definitive, but by using multiple methods, we were able to estimate ranges of likely values, taking into account the uncertainties inherent in estimating etiology in outpatient disease. For all methods, we used previously published data to generate our estimates. The first method we used was a vaccine probe approach. In vaccine probe studies, vaccine efficacy or effectiveness against vaccine type and all-cause disease is used to estimate the proportion of disease attributable to a specific pathogen, in this case, the vaccine serotypes. The second approach we used considered pneumococcal prevalence and serotype distribution for middle ear fluid sampled from children with AOM to estimate attributable proportions. And in the third approach, we took the difference in pneumococcal carriage prevalence in children with AOM and healthy children to estimate the pneumococcal attributable proportion and combined this with the distribution of serotypes and carriage in children with AOM. Next slide. Using these three methods, we estimated that pneumococcus accounts for 14 to 22% of outpatient AOM cases. PCV15-13 serotypes account for 0.7 to 1% of outpatient AOM, and PCV20-13 serotypes account for 3.7 to 5.1% of outpatient AOM. The highest attributable percents were observed from the approach using pneumococcal prevalence and serotype distribution in middle ear fluid. Regardless of method, the distribution of vaccine serotype groups remain fairly constant, with PCV20-13 serotypes accounting for about five times the proportion of outpatient disease covered by PCV15-13 serotypes. Next slide. Using these attributable percents and the all-cause AOM visit and prescription incidence data presented earlier, we estimated the incidence of outpatient visits per 1,000 person years on the left and the annual number of outpatient AOM visits in children on the right. We estimated that 76 to 109,000 visits per year were attributable to PCV15-13 serotypes and 397 to 543,000 visits were attributable to PCV20-13 serotypes. Next slide. Here we show the same data for AOM-associated antibiotic prescriptions. PCV15-13 serotypes are associated with 65 to 93,000 outpatient antibiotic prescriptions annually, and PCV20-13 serotypes are associated with 340 to 464,000 outpatient antibiotic prescriptions annually. Next slide. 
I'll now present the attributable proportion and incidence estimates for pneumonia and sinusitis. Less data is available for these conditions, which you'll see reflected in the wide range of estimates. Next slide. For estimating attributable proportions in pneumonia and sinusitis, we were limited to the vaccine probe and differential carriage approaches. Next slide. Using these methods, we estimated that 12 to 18% of pediatric outpatient pneumonia is attributable to pneumococcus. PCV 15 minus 13 serotypes account for less than 1% of outpatient pediatric pneumonia cases, and PCV 20 minus 13 serotypes account for 2.8 to 4.4% of outpatient pediatric pneumonia cases. Next slide. Again, we multiply these attributable proportions by the all-cause visit and antibiotic prescription estimates presented earlier. And we estimated that PCV15 minus 13 serotypes account for 9 to 14,000 visits and 7 to 11,000 antibiotic prescriptions for outpatient pediatric pneumonia per year. And PCV20 minus 13 serotypes account for 43 to 68,000 visits and 34 to 53,000 antibiotic prescriptions for outpatient pediatric pneumonia per year. Next slide. For sinusitis, we estimated that 12 to 30% of all outpatient pediatric cases are attributable to pneumococcus. PCV15 minus 13 serotypes account for 0.6 to 1.5% of sinusitis cases. And PCV20 minus 13 serotypes account for 2.8 to 7.3% of sinusitis cases. The differential carriage estimates are the same for pneumonia and sinusitis because we use the same estimates for all non-AOM ARIs in that approach given the scarcity of data. Next slide. For sinusitis, we estimated that PCV15 minus 13 serotypes account for 17 to 44,000 visits and 16 to 43,000 antibiotic prescriptions per year, while PCV20 minus 13 serotypes account for 82 to 216,000 visits and 79 to 209,000 antibiotic prescriptions per year. Next slide. So to summarize, next slide. Here we summarize the ranges of point estimates for each condition by vaccine serotype group estimated using the multiple methods we described here. For all three conditions, PCV15 minus 13 serotypes account for 1.9 to 3.4 percent of outpatient disease in children, translating to 103 to 168,000 pediatric outpatient visits and 90 to 148,000 outpatient antibiotic prescriptions annually in the U.S. PCV20 minus 13 serotypes account for 9.4 to 16.8% of outpatient AOM, pneumonia, and sinusitis, translating to 527 to 831,000 pediatric outpatient visits and 458 to 731,000 outpatient antibiotic prescriptions annually in the U.S. Next slide. Our study had several limitations. First, we relied upon previously published data to estimate attributable proportions. Consequently, although data on pneumococcus in all outpatient conditions was limited, this was especially true for sinusitis and pneumonia, and we had to rely on AOM as a proxy for these conditions in some cases. Additionally, due to data limitations at the time of the analysis, our incidence estimates are based on data from 2016 to 2018. And finally, in this study, we assumed healthcare utilization was constant across serotypes for outpatient disease. Next slide. And so to conclude, we estimated that the additional serotypes included in PCV15 and PCV20 account for approximately 100 to 830,000 outpatient visits and 90 to 730,000 outpatient antibiotic prescriptions for AOM, pneumonia, and sinusitis in U.S. children annually. Specifically, PCV15 minus 13 serotypes account for 103 to 168,000 visits and 90 to 148,000 antibiotic prescriptions. And PCV20 minus 13 serotypes account for 527 to 831,000 visits and 458 to 731,000 antibiotic prescriptions.
The percent of outpatient disease attributable to PCV20 minus 13 serotypes was greater than the percent attributable to PCV15 minus 13 serotypes. As a result, the estimated incidence of outpatient pediatric visits and antibiotic prescriptions attributable to PCV20 minus 13 serotypes was four to five times that attributable to PCV15 minus 13 serotypes. Next slide. And I'd like to thank our entire project team and all of you for your attention today. Thank you very much. Uh, this presentation is now open for questions. I'm waiting for Dr. Lehrer to ask his number needed to vaccinate question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but since he, since he hasn't raised his hand, I, I think um, that context would actually be incredibly helpful. Uh, and then one other question perhaps for the, um, the broader team is, uh, you know, when, I, when we look at the proportion of, just to take an example, of pneumonia or otitis media that's actually attributable to the to pneumococcus or let's just say PCV20 uh, additional isolates or is, additional serotypes. Um, I, re I recognize we often don't know the etiologic agent responsible for in, like inpatient pneumonias or otitis media, um, but just out of curiosity, given the range of respiratory uh, vaccines and we were discussing today and tomorrow, I guess I'm just trying to understand in the big picture um, how these various vaccines together could reduce the overall impact of respiratory uh, disease in young children in this particular example. Great. So I'll address maybe that first part and to say we haven't done the calculation of number needed to vaccinate, but I'd be happy to follow up with that information. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to say thank you for the question because we are seeing, as Dr. Romero pointed out, a nasty respiratory season and are seeing the horrific pneumonias. And we do clearly see influenza and then be seeing the bacterial. So increasing the vaccination of both should really significantly um, improve the health of children and keep them out of the hospital. But I don't have the numbers, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. Maybe an aspirational goal for the respiratory disease prevention platform. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised. Thank you very much for that presentation. And we'll move on to Dr. Wendy Watson from Pfizer, who will be presenting uh, PCV20 phase 2 3 data uh, uh, among children. Dr. Watson, the floor is yours. So good afternoon. I'm Wendy Watson, the Pfizer Global Clinical Program Lead for the 20-valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, Prevnar 20, referred to in this presentation as PCV20. I'll be taking you through the PCV20 Pediatric Clinical Development Program and key results today. PCV20 is built on the 20-plus year legacy of Prevnar, PCV7, and Prevnar 13, PCV13. PCV20 contains all the components of PCV PCV13 with seven additional conjugates. Pfizer is seeking to expand PCV20 uh, currently licensed in adults to include the same pediatric indications as PCV13. PCV20 builds on the clinical experience of previous generations of Prevnar and Prevnar13. So PCV7, Prevnar, was licensed based on a randomized controlled clinical efficacy trial of invasive pneumococcal disease in California. In this study of 38,000 infants, a very high efficacy was demonstrated. Subsequently, high vaccine effectiveness was shown following PCV7 introduction. When PCV13 was developed to expand protection against six additional serotypes, it was not considered feasible to perform an efficacy trial. Therefore, a licensing pathway similar to other vaccines, like Kib conjugate vaccine, was pursued. And immunogenicity bridging comparing PCV13 to PCV7 was used to support licensure globally. Similarly, PCV20 licensure for pediatrics will be based on immunogenicity bridging with non-inferiority comparisons to PCV13, a vaccine that now has more than 10 years of demonstrated effectiveness against disease due to vaccine serotypes. This table shows the studies submitted to the FDA to support the PCV20 pediatric indication. 
These pediatric studies were generally modeled on the PCV13 pediatric studies and consist of one phase two study and three phase three studies. The studies listed here were conducted in children in the United States, including Puerto Rico, except for the safety study on the bottom row, which also included infants from other countries. For today's review, I will focus on the pivotal immunogenicity study in infants in the second row and the single dose study in children in the third row. Next. The study design for the pivotal infant trial is shown here. It was a multi-center randomized double blind study enrolling infants in the US, including Puerto Rico. The study enrolled approximately 2000 participants who were randomized equally to receive four doses of PCV20 or PCV13. Pediarix and Hibarix were given concomitantly with the first three doses and MMR and varicella vaccines were given with the fourth dose. Influenza and rotavirus vaccines were permitted with, um, to be given with study vaccine in age-eligible participants. Blood was collected for immunogenicity assessments one month after the third dose, before the fourth dose, and one month after the fourth dose. The primary study objectives were to describe safety, to evaluate the immunogenicity of PCV20, including non-inferiority comparisons of PCV20 to PCV13, and to assess responses of specific concomitantly administered vaccines. The disposition and demographics of the study population are on the table at the right. The groups were well balanced with respect to sex, race, and ethnicity. Excellent. Pneumococcal conjugate vaccines generate complex and diverse cellular humoral and humoral immune responses that all play a role in imparting protection. The primary and key secondary objectives, which were agreed prospectively with the FDA, are listed at the top of the slides and are comparisons of IgG antibody responses. We also assessed other aspects of the responses, including other IgG responses, functional antibodies measured as OPA titers, and boosting of IgG and OPA antibody levels, which are indicative of immune memory. The assessment of the totality of data for serotypes that miss non-inferiority was agreed prospectively, also was agreed prospectively by the FDA. An example of how important this assessment is comes from the previous experience with PCV13 and serotypes 6V and 9V. These two serotypes missed a co-primary objective for non-inferiority compared to PCV7, but the totality of immunogenicity data supported licensure and subsequent real-world effectiveness has shown that PCV13 protects against invasive pneumococcal disease caused by these two serotypes. This slide shows a forest plot of the results of one of the co-primary objectives in the study. The percentage of participants with the predefined IgG concentration after dose three. Non-inferiority was declared if the 95% confidence interval of the difference was greater than minus 10%, shown here as the vertical dashed line. The additional seven serotypes at the bottom were compared to the lowest result in the PCV13 group, excluding serotype three. In this case, the comparison was to serotype 23F result in the PCV13 group. You can see that 14 serotypes met the non-inferiority criteria for this objective, and six serotypes missed non-inferiority, although serotypes 1, 4, 9V, and 23F only missed statistical non-inferiority by a small margin. Serotypes 3 and 12F missed by a greater margin, but the totality of data was supportive, as I'll show you. Additionally, we have explored the public reference standard that's used to calculate 12F IgG concentrations and believe this may be underestimating 12F IgG results, and we have shared our findings uh, with the FDA. Next slide. Continuing to look at the response after dose 3, this forest plot shows the IgG geometric mean concentration ratios in the PCV20 group compared to the PCV13 group for each vaccine serotype. This was the key secondary objective in the study. Non-inferiority was to be declared for this objective if the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval of the ratio was greater than 0.5 noted again by the vertical dashed line. All 20 serotypes met non-inferiority for this comparison, including serotypes 3 and 12F. 
As noted, the prior data slides show the comparison of the seven additional serotypes to the result of a vaccine serotype in the PCV13 group. However, I did want to show you that the actual IgG geometric mean concentrations to those seven additional serotypes in the PCV13 uh, group after dose three are low, shown in the yellow rows. The IgG con um, geometric mean concentrations for the seven additional serotypes were substantially higher in the PCV20 group compared to the PCV13 control group. This was also the case after dose four. We also looked at functional antibodies elicited by the vaccine after dose three. The OPA geometric mean titers are plotted for the PCV20 and PCV13 groups in turquoise and blue respectively. You can see the responses to the 13 match serotypes were similar between groups, even for serotypes that missed the co-primary IgG uh, objective at this dose. PCV20 also elicited very robust functional activity to the seven additional serotypes, including 12F. Moving on to the response after the toddler dose, dose four in the study, this slide shows the other co-primary objective. The forest plot in this slide shows the IgG geometric mean concentration ratios one month after the fourth dose of PCV20 compared to PCV13. Again, non-inferiority is declared if the lower confidence interval is above 0.5, the vertical dashed line on the forest plot. Similar to the result for the IgG geometric mean concentration ratios after dose three, all 20 vaccine serotypes met non-inferiority after dose four. An important property of conjugate vaccines is their ability to elicit memory responses. These bar graphs show the antibody levels in the PCV20 group after dose three in the lighter color and after dose four in the darker color. It's clear that there are numerically higher antibody levels after the toddler dose than after the infant series. This is observed for both IgG geometric mean concentrations in the top graph and OPA geometric mean titers in the bottom graph for the vaccine serotypes. Boosting of immune responses after the toddler dose is a significant marker indicating that a memory response has been induced after the infant series by PCB20. In addition to evaluating the pneumococcal responses, we evaluated responses to concomitant vaccines. The forest plot on the left shows the difference in percent of participants with pre-specified antibody levels to the different antigens in Pediarix and Hibarix, given with the, th the three infant doses of PCV20 or PCV13. All met the non-inferiority criteria. The forest plot on the right shows the responses to MMR and varicella vaccines given with dose four of PCV20 or PCV13. And again, all met the non-inferiority criteria as well. These data support PCV20 use in routine pediatric schedules. I will now turn to some safety data from this trial. The rate and severity of solicited reactions are plotted in these bar graphs. Local reactions by dose are in the top graph and systemic events in the bottom graph. The PCV20 group is in turquoise and the PCV13 group is in blue. Severity is noted by the different hues. Injection site pain, drowsiness, and irritability were the most common events. Most reactions were mild or moderate, and the rates were similar across both groups and consistent with the historical experience with PCV13. As mentioned previously, another important phase three study assessed the safety and immunogenicity of a single dose of PCV20 in children 15 months to less than 18 years of age. This study was conducted in the U.S. to support use of PCV20 in children through 17 years of age. The study design is shown on this slide. And it was a multi-center, single-arm trial of approximately 800 healthy participants, approximately 200 per age group. Participants 15 months to five years of age were required to have a documentation of at least three doses of PCV13 prior to enrollment and the demographics of participants across the different age groups are shown in the table. 
This slide shows a bar graph of the IgG geometric mean concentrations for the two age groups less than five years of age. The results in children 15 to less than 24 months of age is on top, and children two to less than five years of age is on the bottom. The antibody levels before PCV20 are the light bars, and one month after PCV20 are the darker bars. As you can see, one dose of PCV20 elicited a robust IgG responses to all 20 serotypes in these children previously vaccinated with PCV13. Data from the youngest group also supports potential for replacement of PCV13 with PCV20 in the schedule. In the interest of time, I'm not showing the other results, but there was a similar pattern in the functional antibody responses in these age groups, as well as IgG and OPA responses in older children. And the safety data was consistent with historical experience with PCV13. Finally, this table provides an overview of the PCV20 safety results from the clinical trials. There were no clinically significant differences in the adverse events in the PCV20 and PCV13 um, control group. Serious adverse events were reported in 4.5% of PCV20 recipients and 3.7% of PCV13 recipients in the infant studies supporting U.S. licensure. No serious adverse events in this data set were considered related to vaccine and no deaths were reported. Next slide. So in summary, PCV20 is well tolerated when administered as a four dose series to infants and as a single dose to toddlers through older children with a safety profile similar to PCV13. The totality of data shows that PCV20 elicits IgA, IgG, and OPA responses in infants for all vaccine serotypes consistent with PCV13. A single dose of PCV20 elicited IgG and functional immune responses to all uh, 20 serotypes in children 15 months to eight, less than 18 years of age, including those with prior PCV13. And PCV20 uh, is compatible with routine pediatric vaccines. PCV20 is currently under review by the FDA for use in the pediatric population six weeks to less than 18 years of age with a target action date in April 2023. And PCV20 has the potential to address a substantial burden of pneumococcal disease in children. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this presentation is now open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Could could you just um, go back to the slide that has serious adverse events? And if you could just let us know a little bit about the types of serious adverse events. I recognize that they were judged by the investigators as not related, but if you could just review types of events um, um, f for those. And I realize it's also comparative with PCB 13, but um, thank you. So hopefully this slide will, will help with that, provide a little bit more detail on that question. Um, really, the, the serious adverse events primarily came from infections and infestations uh, system organ class. So we had a lot of infections, um, you know, in both groups, respiratory infections, particularly during our uh, season, but a multitude of other different infections that actually had an, an etiology diagnosed. We also had uh, some um, accidents, some, some traumatic injuries in, uh, that accounted for some of the um, serious adverse events and uh, some dehydration, failure to thrive, malnutrition um, in, in both groups, but there were uh, more in the 20-valent in the, uh, group. Th does this help answer the question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Dr. Lair. So this is a, a general question. Um, often when we look at GMRs, such as what you have on page seven, the lower confidence level is 0 0.67. And here for most of your comparisons, it's 0 0.5. And I totally understand that you negotiated or worked with the FDA to come up with an appropriate line. I'm just curious how you chose 0 0.5 versus 0 0.67. 
that's a very long standing uh, endpoint and criteria for pneumococcal conjugate uh, vaccines that we've uh, used. That means that uh, the actual point estimate has to be uh, you know, less than, than uh, has to be within twofold or, or closer to the actual uh, control. And we do have to be careful when we're m measuring multiple valencies uh, with, you know, we're getting into the 40 to 60 comparisons that um, having too rigid of a, of a lower bound um, criteria like 0.67, would probably run into feasibility and would by chance prevent a good vaccine from being licensed. Thank you. I'm gonna, oh, Ms. Bata, go ahead. Um, could you describe um, some of the um, uh, grade three fevers that were going on um, post-vaccination with PCV20? Yep. Well, I, I have a table of, of um, temperatures uh, greater than 104 uh, Fahrenheit in the um, two different groups. And we did not have very many, but we did have uh, seven cases in the um, 20 valent group and two cases in the uh, 13 valent group. These generally appeared in, on day one to uh, two, although we did have a couple on day six. The duration of the high temperature was generally short-lived with a, one, one exception, really. One, one uh, participant had uh, five days of, of higher temperature um, and they uh, resolved um, with, with that, you know, none of these were associated with uh, uh, hospitalization, except for one, one child also had a concurrent illness of RSV bronchiolitis at that same Thank you. time. That was in the PCV13 group. Dr. Paling? Yes, I wanted, um, when we look at the elevated um, temperatures, we always, um, as pediatricians, think about febrile seizures. And so wanted to give you an opportunity to clarify about febrile seizures. Thank you. Okay, so none of these, those children with 104 had a, a febrile seizure. We did have uh, nine febrile seizures altogether over the course of the, the four pediatric uh, studies. Um, when you look at the percentage, it was between 0.2% you know, in the PCV20 group and 0.1% and, uh, in the PCV13 group. There were two cases of febrile seizure within two weeks of uh, a vaccination. In one case, the child also had a concurrent COVID uh, illness. And in the other case, uh, in the case of a fever, 14 days after dose four, the investigator considered this possibly related to MMR and varicella, did not consider it related to uh, vaccination. The remaining febrile seizures were um, much further out from vaccination. Thank you. I, well, I have a I have a couple of questions. I'm actually going to ask my my colleagues um, as well as Dr. Watson to just run through the logic for me. And I'm asking this partly because we're um, making a decision based on immunogenicity data, and I just want to make sure I have a clear understanding of it. Um, so, in this instance, when I look at hmm, slide eight. I think it's slide eight on yours, which is post dose three, the percentage with predefined yeah, concentrations, one of the co primary endpoints. Yeah, this one? Uh, yes, that one. No, actually, the one before it. Okay, this is the percent, right, this is the percentage with predefined IgG concentrations. Right. Yeah. So, um, it, actually, first of all, let me just say that I really appreciated that you showed multiple uh, sort of approaches to looking at immunogenicity because I actually found it very helpful because if we only had one look, I think you could you know, walk away with a simpler impression. And I think by showing that, like, the, the variety of the types of immune response that you're looking at, it actually was really helpful to me. Um, so I'm gonna ask my 
my basic question <laughs> to my colleagues and to uh, Dr. Watson. Um, my impression on the immunogenicity, and, and part of the reason I ask is because typically I don't usually see um, sort of endpoints fall below the inferiority, the non-inferiority line. Um, and you know, if we think about non-inferiority, I recognize there's a buffer around that. So minus 10, per, nine, minus 10 percent in this instance, but you know, zero would be sort of ideal state in a, ma in a manner of speaking. Um, so if I look at this, I can see that you had mentioned 14 serotypes out of the 20 met non-inferiority. And I'm looking at serotype 3 and I think 12F, if I can read it correctly, uh, which fall below the line. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, when I look at, let's see, one, two, slide, the slide that has functional antibody responses, I can see that the functional antibody responses look fairly um, similar. Uh, so my question really is, do I need to think about the, like the overall immune response and assuming that you can use um, humoral immunity as a combination of not only quantity but function? So the function seems to be similar in picture, um, but the quantity may be somewhat lower in nature uh, so that the quality of the response is a reflection of that quantity and the function? Well, I, I think that... Yes, I mean, I think that it, the quality of the response is probably most important rather than the actual, say, uh, absolute IgG level. You have to take both into uh, consideration in, um, you know, in looking at your, your responses. Um, so I mean, we, we couldn't do, uh, you know, we, we did look at functional antibody in, in subsets of participants because there's no way we would have the volume from infants to be able to um, look at, uh, to, to, to be able to, um, you know, get as much OPA sample size as we need with, with that. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it's important just not to base things on, a, on solely one uh, endpoint. When we had, um, you know, we know th this comes from our experience with, uh, Prevnar um, 13 that we did miss two serotypes uh, and we were, you know, missed non inferiority for the two serotypes and we were, uh, you know, the vaccine's been very good at protecting against those two serotypes even though we did um, miss on those. Um, Thank you. And so, so, yeah. uh, so looking at... Um, sort of like the post-dose 3 and post-dose 4 IgG concentrations um, for the original 13, they sort of look at or slightly below, oh, I'm looking at this wrong. So one is a percentage of the concentration and the other is a GMR. But just looking at it, I mean, the functional antibody response to me looks really reasonable and quite similar. I guess I'm just struggling with how to translate this into what is the actual efficacy and effectiveness going to be in the real world setting and trying to understand. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you pulled up a slide that maybe speaks to this, but that, this yeah. is where I'm struggling to understand. Um, yeah. Are we going to have, make, be making a trade-off potentially for certain serotypes? And we already heard that serotype 3 was a fairly common one in the post-PCB13 era. So just thinking about... Um, you know, what, what the opportunity cost is, even though I think, you know, we will clearly be gaining the additional uh, seven serotypes and that that's clearly, you know, superior in this instance. I think, you know, I, I think it's important that, that functional antibody has a big role in, in, in protection as well as memory responses. I can show you, I mean, no, but, uh, I can show you reverse cumulative distribution curves that might be, Somewhat reassuring. Here, let me um, show. Bring this up. So these, this is reverse cumulative distribution curves for the responses, IgG responses after each of the, for each of the serotypes after the three doses, and the dark blue solid line is the 20 valent um, responses, and the uh, dot red dotted line are the PCV13 responses. And you can see that they're not that different. Even serotype 3, which, which missed, is not that different from the uh, PCV13 arm. It's kind of where the, you know, this, this vertical line falls. But overall, the population is only slightly different than 
PCB13. And that's consistent with the, the 13 match serotypes. So to me, this figure for just looking at IgGs is very reassuring that it's not binary, that what we've done has not, you know, that uh, we've added the protection for the additional serotypes and we've uh, kept the IgG concentrations fairly similar, even though that one data point did uh, show um, not a uh, miss non-inferiority, you know, for especially, you know, for serotype three and um, 12F is compared to, uh, you know, for 12F, it's compared to the lowest of the prevalent 13 serotypes, but you can see it's well above the, the Pregnant 13 group. Okay, thank you. And then my other quick, oh great, Dr. Sanchez has a question. I'm hoping you ask my question. <laughs> no, no. Thank you. Um, I know that this was not an efficacy trial, but did you, were any uh, breakthrough infections seen at all? Particularly we didn't have invasive. Any, uh, any invasive, pneumococcal invasive disease in our, in these studies. Thank you. And then my only, my last question, um, just for clarification, and partly because of the introduction. Um, oh, can you please speak uh, speak up again? No, Malaco, did we lose you? We didn't hear the answer to Dr. Sanchez's question. Oh, oh, uh, our, our answer was that we did not see any cases of invasive pneumococcal disease in our study population. Thank you. And then my, my last question was really just, oh, Dr. Daly. I see Dr. Daly's hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a follow-up question to Dr. Lee's line of questioning. Um, it's about trade-offs, and I remember this conversation with respect to PCV7 and PCV13. So... This is a two-part question. First, um, is the conjugated protein amount of every zero group the same in PCV20 as it is in PCV13? You know, the, the amount of protein that your immune system is responding to, essentially. By serotype, it's the same. Right. So, uh, the, yeah. Okay. And then is there... Uh, biologic plausibility to the argument that 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 you uh, that there's competition uh, that response to one serotype can compete against response to another serotype because I remember that as a theoretical concern with PCV7 and 13 um, but we're just not discussing it here is there a, um, a limit to the amount of serotypes you can respond to and that response to one serotype may reduce your response to another serotype thank you that, that's definitely a great question, and I don't have the answer for that. Is there a minimum, say, minimum or maximum number of serotypes you can put into a single vaccine, or, or where you'll start to get uh, a, you know, serious uh, impact on uh, the Im immune response? Right now, we're just seeing a, a small increment. We don't, we're not seeing a large magnitude uh, in the in the immunologic impact. And again, that was a concern when you know, we went from seven to 13 and the 13 has been very good. We, we haven't seen uh, problems with um, containing or controlling the uh, shared serotypes between seven and 13. Dr. Sanchez, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, my last question was whether or not you had uh, looked at immunogenicity, well, two, two related questions. One is, uh, did you have any uh, individuals who were immunocompromised or had sickle cell disease or other conditions where we might be worried about um, immunogenicity and or efficacy and effectiveness? Uh, and then the second is if you did, um, and or just even thinking about, uh, you know, qualitatively understanding if there were any differences in the immunogenicity, for example, by race, ethnicity uh, as, one, as one example, but immunocompromised being another example. Uh, did you have any of that information available by chance? Okay, so the, the quick answer is that we did not do specific we, um, studies with 
uh, immunocompromised uh, children or those with uh, sickle cell, cell disease. We had had uh, we have a lot of experience with Prevnar and Prevnar 13 showing that the safety is um, you know it is acceptable in that population and comparable to the general population. Um, and while there may be um, uh, you know, those populations may have a lower immunogenicity overall to 7 and 13, we would expect that 20 um, would respond similarly to 13 in those populations. Um, so we, we don't have that. We did do some safety. We do have some safety with some late-term, late preterm late infants, um, 34 to 37 weeks gestation. The safety looks very similar to uh, those with, with term infants. Um, and uh, we did, your, your question about the subgroup analysis, we did look at subgroups uh, you know, of um, you know, Afri African-American. That was the largest population that we had as a single population in addition to the, the, the white um, population. And we saw um, you really, there wasn't really any significant differences. If anything, there's maybe for some serotypes, maybe a tad bit higher, but you can't, you have to be careful because those are smaller uh, data sets. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Can I just follow up on that? Were immunocompromised uh, infants included in the trials or no, no. right? So we don't no. really have any data. People here are shaking yeah. their heads. Not for 20. <laughs> right. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Watson, for your presentation. We will move on to the next presentation, which is um, Dr. Kobayashi, who will be um, speaking about the evidence to recommendation framework, including grade for PCB20 use in children. Thank you. Okay, hey, um, good afternoon. On behalf of the work group, I will present the data and work group's interpretation of PCV20 use among US children using the evidence to recommendations framework. The ETR framework consists of the seven domains shown here. But today, the presentation will cover the three domains that the work group discussed so far, public health problem, benefits and harms, and equity. As Dr. Paling mentioned beginning, Currently, all children under two years have the same pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. Either PCV13 or 15 can be given using a three-dose primary series at two, four, and six months and a booster dose at 12 to 15 months. So our first policy question is, should PCV20 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal conjugate vaccination according to currently recommended dosing and schedules for U.S. children under two years? Children two years or older with certain underlying medical conditions who have an increased risk of pneumococcal disease have risk-based recommendations to receive either one or two doses of PPSV23 in addition to the recommended PCV doses. So the second policy question is, should PCV20 without PPSV23 be recommended as an option for pneumococcal vaccination for U.S. children 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease? Here are these policy questions in a PICO format. And for both PICO questions, the comparison is the current recommendations for the respective groups. Their critical outcomes will be discussed later. The first domain is public health problem. As summarized in presentations from earlier, use of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines significantly decreased the incidence of pneumococcal disease in U.S. children. Outpatient acute respiratory illness caused by pneumococcus such as acute otitis media, sinusitis, and pneumonia are common causes of outpatient visits and antibiotic prescribing. The risk of disease remain high in children with underlying conditions that increase the risk of pneumococcal disease. And in 2018 to 2019, the proportion of IPD caused by vaccine serotypes was approximately 30% for additional serotypes contained in PCV20, but not in PCV13. 
and 15% for additional serotypes contained in PCV15 and not in PCV13. The work group determined that pneumococcal disease is of public health importance for both groups of children. There was variability in the work group interpretation for children under two years due to the significant reductions in pneumococcal disease among these children. However, most work group members agreed that pneumococcal disease continues to be of public health importance due to the remaining disease burden. Next is benefits and harms. The work group interpretation of this domain was mainly informed by the great evidence profile for the PICO questions shown earlier. The outcomes deemed critical were vaccine type IPD, vaccine type pneumonia, vaccine type acute otitis media, and vaccine type pneumococcal deaths. And uh, there are currently no studies assessing PCV20 effectiveness against these clinical outcomes. So PCV20 immunogenicity studies were used as evidence for these outcomes. To supplement this, we also reviewed post-licensure PCV13 and PPSP23 effectiveness data against these outcomes as a background. Regarding outcomes related to harms, work group members deem serious adverse events as of critical importance. Evidence of serious adverse events was available and reviewed for PCV20. First, I will present a summary of the post-licensure PCV13 vaccine effectiveness data. There are several post-licensure studies that assessed PCV13 effectiveness against IPD. Here are a summary of studies that assess the effectiveness against vaccine type IPD in multiple countries, including the US, that used a three plus one schedule is shown. In general, these studies showed that PCV13 is highly effective against vaccine type IPD. Data on PCV13 effectiveness against vaccine type pneumonia in children are limited. From the two studies done in China and Israel, PCV13 is likely to be protective against vaccine type pneumococcal pneumonia, but with a wide confidence interval. Data on PCV13 effectiveness against vaccine type pneumococcal acute otitis media are also limited. Estimates from these studies also tend to have wide confidence intervals, though data suggest that PCV13 is likely protective against vaccine type pneumococcal acute otitis media. Data on PPSB23 effectiveness against pneumococcal disease in children with underlying conditions were very limited. A study conducted before introduction of PCV in the US showed that PPSB23 is protective against vaccine type IPD among children with underlying medical conditions. Data on PPSB23 effectiveness against non-invasive pneumococcal disease in children are even more limited. In a recent systematic review, no study that assessed PPSV23 vaccine effectiveness against acute otitis media was identified. Two randomized control trials that evaluated the efficacy of administrating both PCV7 and PPSV23 against acute otitis media did not show any efficacy in the intervention groups. Okay. Now I will summarize data on PCV20 use in children. We conducted a systematic review of literature on PCV20 use among children. The search strategy and search terms used are available in the supplementary slides. Overall, four studies were included for grade. Three were considered for evidence of routine PCV20 use, and one was considered for evidence of PCV20 use in children with underlying medical conditions. Evidence of benefits of PCV20 use among children under two years was informed by two randomized control trials that randomized healthy children to receive either PCV13 or PCV20. And you uh, just uh, heard about the results of the pivotal trial. Uh, PCVs were uh, given using the three-dose primary series followed by a booster dose. The studies show that PCV20 had numerically lower immune responses compared with PCV13 for most of the 13 shared serotypes. Post-dose 3, PCV20 did not meet the non-inferiority criteria compared with PCV13 for some seer types for the primary immunogenicity outcome. Post-dose 4, PCV20 met the non-inferiority criteria compared with PCV13 for all 13 shared seer types and for all seven additional seer types. Evidence of harms was informed by findings from three randomized control trials. Across the three studies, 
serious adverse events were reported in 4.5% of the PCV20 recipients compared with 3.7% of the PCV13 recipients, but none were considered to be vaccine related. The overall certainty of evidence was moderate. Certainty of evidence for benefits was downgraded since these are immunogenicity studies and there are no correlates of protection established for most outcomes of interest. For harm, certainty of evidence was downgraded for imprecision due to lack of vaccine-related serious adverse events being reported. The work group determined that the desirable anticipated effects of PCV20 were moderate. PCV20 provides the broadest serotype coverage among available PCV, so it is expected to prevent more disease. However, it is unknown how substantial the protection conferred from PCV20 will be based on available data. The undesirable anticipated effects were considered to be minimal. The work group's interpretation of the question, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects, was split between favors intervention which is PCV20 use, and favors both, which are both the intervention and the comparator, either PCV13 or PCV15 use. Those who favor the intervention believe that PCV20 is expected to prevent more disease compared with current PCVs. Those who favor both consider the uncertainties of the clinical implications of the lower immunogenicity of PCV20 and improved immunogenicity of PCV15 against serotype 3 compared with PCV13. Findings from the pediatric PCV15 immunogenicity studies were presented during the February ACIP meeting last year. There are no studies that were conducted among children 2 to 18 years with underlying medical conditions, and the evidence on benefits was informed by one phase 3 non-randomized cl clinical trial with no comparator evaluating the safety and immunogenicity of PCV20 use in healthy children 15 months to 17 years. This included children under five years who had received at least three doses of PCV13. All participants received a dose of PCV20. The study showed that PCV20 was immunogenic for all 20 vaccine serotypes when assessed one month after vaccination compared with pre-vaccination baseline. Serious adverse events after vaccination was reported in 0.6% of the participants and none were considered to be vaccine related. The overall certainty of evidence was very low. Certainty of evidence was downgraded further for this study since this was an open-label, non-randomized control trial with no comparator group, and the study did not include children with underlying conditions. The work group determined that the desirable anticipated effects of PCV20 use were moderate, and the reasons were similar to those for routine use for children under two years. In addition, there are no data on PCV20 use among children with underlying medical conditions, and that was brought up during our discussion. The undesirable anticipated effects were considered to be minimal. The work group's interpretation of the question, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects, was split between favors intervention, which is PCV20 use, and favors both, which are both the intervention and the comparator, PPSV23 use after currently recommended PCV doses. Those who favor the intervention believe that PCV20 is expected to prevent more disease compared with current recommendations. Those who favor both consider the fact that there are no data on PCV20 use in this population and the uncertainties of the clinical implications of the improved immunogenicity of PCV15 against serotype 3 compared with PCV13. The next domain is equity. This table summarizes the estimated pneumococcal conjugate vaccine coverage by age 24 months among children born to, uh, during 2018 to 2019 by health insurance status using data from the National Immunization Survey child. Compared with coverage among children with private insurance only, children who were uninsured and those insured by Medicaid and other insurance was lower. Nationally representative PPSB23 vaccine coverage data among children with indications are limited. In a study among children enrolled in the Michigan Medicaid program, 64% of children with sickle cell anemia received four doses of PCV followed by a dose of PPSB23 as recommended by age five years. 
53% received four doses of PCV, followed by two doses of PPSV23 as recommended by age 10 years. Other studies that assessed PPSV23 coverage among children with underlying medical conditions were much lower, ranging from 20 to 40%. This figure is based on an unpublished analysis using CDC's active bacterial core surveillance data that assessed the incidence rate difference of IPD among children 17 years and younger in the highest and the lowest census tract poverty categories by year. Each panel represents from top left to bottom right the incidence rate difference for all serotypes, PCB13 serotypes, PCB15 non-PCB13 serotypes, PCV20 non-PCV13 serotypes, PCV20 non-PCV15 serotypes, and non-vaccine serotypes from 2010 to 2019. For all serotypes and PCV13 serotypes, incidence rate difference decreased after 2010 after PCV13 was recommended for use in children. There was essentially no incidence rate difference for PCV15 non-PCV13 serotypes in 2018 to 2019. IPD incidence rate difference for ad the additional serotypes contained in PCV20 remained, and there was a slightly larger incidence rate difference for non-vaccine serotypes. The work group believed that PCV20 use among children in both groups will probably increase health equity. However, there were some differences in the inter interpretation among work group members. For routine PCV20 use among children under two, some believed that new interventions like PCV20 are likely to be accessible to the wealthy communities first and therefore could reduce health equity. However, others believed that programs such as VFC and school requirements allow high vaccine coverage across the population, and post-PCV13 data showed that vaccine can reduce disparities due to vaccine-type pneumococcal disease. Some believe that there's probably no impact since remaining disparities in vaccine-type disease seem to be minimal. Some believe that equity will be increased based on our, on our experience post-PCV13. For PCV20 use in children with underlying conditions, some believed a risk-based recommendation is less likely to be equitable compared with routine vaccine recommendations. On the other hand, some believed that PCV20 use could simplify the current risk-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendations and improve vaccine coverage. Here is a preliminary summary of the work group's interpretation of the three ETR domains for the two PICO questions. The work group believed that pneumococcal disease is of public health importance. Compared with the current recommendations, the benefits of PCB20 use were considered to be moderate and have minimal undesirable effects. The work group's interpretation was split between fevers intervention, which is PCB20 use, and fevers both intervention and current recommendations. The certainty of evidence was moderate for both benefits and harms for routine PCV20 use in children under two, whereas the certainty of evidence was very low for children two to 18 years with risk-based recommendations. PCV20 use was considered to probably increase health equity, although some work group members expressed different opinions. In the next presentation, I will cover the work group considerations and next steps, uh, but I would like to uh, pause here and I would like to um, thank um, the committee, the pneumococcal vaccines work group, and the following individuals for their contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobayashi. And you know, again, thank you to you, Dr. Paling, and the work group for the incredible work that you do literally every time we meet. Um, so th thank you again for bringing together a tremendous amount of data and um, putting a very difficult uh, set of questions on our plate. So this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Talbot. Okay, so um, the pediatricians have been talking, I mean, have been teaching me about um, good use of federal funds. So um, I'm gonna ask this question. Um, it looks like, if, if I'm reading this correctly, that of the remaining disease, this new vaccine could help eliminate about a quarter of what's left. 
um, which most of it was taken out with the prior two vaccines. Um, do we have any idea if this is cost effective for that many cases? Um, so that will be coming next. Um, we will be presenting, hopefully at the next ACIP meeting, um, cost effective analyses. Um, uh, there'll be more than one, so that we'll be reviewing. Dr. Daly? Yeah, Dr. Kobayashi, could you just sort of give us, sort of open the door to the work group discussions about this trade-off of, of total disease prevention? Because I am, through the course of the day, a little bit more concerned about a trade-off being perhaps less three disease or 19F disease or something, and just, just insight into the work group discussion about that very topic. Yes, um, thank you very much for that question. I think you know that is reflected in the work group interpretation of the domain uh, benefits and harms. Um, one of the question was, you know, does the benefit out outweigh the harms? And the work group um, interpretation was split between favors intervention, which is PCV twenties, and P favors both. And that's you know, a lot of people uh, who favored both. Um, you know, we're expressing that, you know, we don't know what the, you know, interpretation of the, or clinical implication of the immunogenicity studies will be. And then uh, last year, um, uh, representatives from Merck presented the PCV15 data. Um, and, you know, how would that translate um, in terms of clinical protection? Uh, we, we, there are a lot of unknowns. So that, that was reflected in the work group's interpretation there. Dr. Paling? Um, and building on both um, your questions, with adults, one of the sensitivity analyses we did is assume that there was no benefit to three, and we're planning on do, um, showing that as well so that we can see what the range of potentials could be. Dr. Lair? Could you please go to slide 95? Um, and could you give me sort of the work group's thoughts if you take away PPSV23, are you going to just put in a PCV20 in those spots? Is that one of the, the work group is thinking? So yes, and you know we will discuss further um, as a work group as we um, uh, have more time to uh, talk about the specific uh, uh, policy options. You know, we a lot of work group members uh, would like to see the cost effectiveness analysis data first, but you know potentially we'll just have a PCV recommendation without PPSV23. So to follow up, can you go to the next slide? Um, and I assume you have the answer to this. Oops. Go one more, please. One more. OK. Um, you had a question, a policy question. Should PCV20 without PPSV23 be recommended? And I, I wonder if you've considered doing both. I, I assume there's a reason not to, but I'm wondering if you, if you could ex expound upon that. Yes, and that will actually be part of the next uh, presentation, uh, what additional uh, considerations the work group is making. May I chime in? Okay, so I very much appreciate your um, astute observation. There are very few children who are 6 to 18 and have received no, vac no pneumococcal vaccines, but it does occur, especially for children that have um, immigrated to the United States. And so currently it is a PPSV23 recommendation. And so the discussion would be could um, a conjugate vaccine, and some people preferenced the um, PCV20 over the 1315 because they liked that. And so that was part of the debate and where you get some of the split, if that provides a little context on many hours of discussions. Uh, Dr. Long. Um, in response to Dr. Daly, you, you it, it's interesting to see how all of you pick up on all of the things that we spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours discussing in the work group. And um, a major one was the immunogenicity and geometric means, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, that hasn't always been a direct correlation with mm -hmm. um, effectiveness as far mm -hmm. as we don't know what the minimum Mm -hmm. required 
uh, antibody is. An antibody of this type that you measure by geometric mean may not really even be as important as opsonic things, et cetera. So it, it is a trade-off in a sense. We don't know for serotype 3 if the additional immunogenicity of 15 will translate to any better efficacy. Mm -hmm. That would be terrific because serotype 3 is a problem, and it's a big problem in mm -hmm. adults uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, but we don't know that these more modest responses to PCV20, they're, they're so modest in their difference, except for an occasional serotype, and three might be an important one. Um, we don't know how that will translate or if it will translate. So we're dealing with, you know, no efficacy for both of these vaccines, 15 and 20. So we have to kind of wait to see how that pans out. In the meantime, your, your, your inference that more serotypes, there may be an end to how many serotypes you can put in a vaccine. I mean, is the immune system going to see every one of them identically? And all serotypes are not equal. The serotypes in PCV7 were against the most virulent encapsulated pneumococci. 13 picked up a couple of really important ones and then more. 15 picked up a couple more. 20 picked up a few more than 15. But as we get toward that end, you see that the potential impact, unless there's a serotype that replaces and maybe gets antibiotic resistance, it's, it's going to be diminishing returns. And, and we still have a large portion of non-vaccine serotypes that I don't know that anybody is going to pursue. Uh, there are some people who are pursuing it. Will that be as effective against the ones that were more virulent, that were 100 mm -hmm. for 100,000 children or under five with invasive pneumococcal disease. We don't want to lose that. So in fact, it is. Uh, we're dealing with things we don't know the impact of the antibody response. And we know probably that antibody is not necessarily the critical uh, marker. So you're absolutely right. You picked up on everything. Thank you, Dr. Long. Any other comments or questions? Well, just reflecting on the ETR framework itself, um, I, and this might have been a um, intentional choice, but I, you know, I do think that that there is not only benefit to the kids, but the indirect impact on older adults is potentially substantial, and that I believe to be true. So I'm just wondering. Uh, whether or not that might also be considered a potential benefit. Um, I recognize it's still the same trade-offs potentially in that um, if there is concern about gain in some serotypes, the potential for loss without you know, clarity about how it would translate in others that are relevant, um, it might be sort of six of one, half dozen the other, but it does feel like at least acknowledging the uh, indirect impact in herd immunity would be a really important aspect of the benefits of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines, and particularly when we get to this particular question around um, even, well, this is a different question. I think that that's probably something else, but still it just uh, has seemed to be a much uh, more effective uh, vaccine overall. Dr. In response to Dr. Lair's question about 23 and 20, 20 and 23, I'm not a pneumococcal expert, but I listen to them on the work group. And there isn't a single pneumococcal expert who thinks this polysaccharide 23 vaccine has the immunogenicity or the legs to be considered as an additional to a PCV or in replacement of PCV that we now have. They all believe that PCV20, because of inducing immunologic memory and uh, you know getting T cells to participate, is so superior to PPSV23 that um, 
we would want to have a world with conjugate vaccines at the expense of potentially losing 23. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to, um, th there was a request. Uh, we have a comment uh, for from Dr. Richard Haupt from Merck, who would uh, like to make a comment. Dr. Haupt, if you're on the line, I would just ask that you keep it to three minutes. I will do so. i uh, just checking the audio, can you hear me okay? And if you get a little closer to the mic, that would be helpful. Okay, um, as close as I can get, so I'll, I'll uh, this is Rick Halp. I head up the uh, Global Medical and Scientific Affairs at Merck. And thank you for, for the time to make some comments today. My comments are really focused on the pneumococcal disease burden in children in the U.S. And today's discussion highlights the importance of maintaining really um, Im important epidemiological vigilance as the pneumococcal vaccine landscape evolves. This was the first time that we were seeing post-COVID disease burden trends. And it's notable that serotypes 3, 19A and 19F remain important in causing disease in children and underscores the, the, the need to maintain protection against these PCV15 and PCV13 vaccine type serotypes. The trends are also notable for the disease burden of the youngest age group. The CDC presentation included estimates for pneumonia in children less than a year of age. And similar trends have been observed for other outcomes such as IPD in children less than one year of age, highlighting the importance of early vaccine protection. And then lastly, we saw that pneumococcal vaccination coverage rates reveal persistent disparities. This was particularly true for the fourth dose where roughly 20% of Medicaid children missed that booster dose, therefore relying on early protection from the three dose primary series. You know, as a vaccine community, I, we clearly need to address this vaccine series completion rate disparity. It's one of the most important things that we need to we need to work on. As it, no matter what pneumococcal vaccines are developed or used. Thanks again for the time. Thank you, Dr. Hobbs. Um, next, we'll move on to work group considerations and next steps. Back to you, Dr. Kobayashi. Thank you very much. Uh, this will be the last presentation of this session. Um, and uh, this is the uh, policy questions that we are currently considering again, um, as a reminder. And in addition, we will conduct cost effectiveness analysis to assess the incremental benefit of PPSV23 use, in addition to PCV20 in children aged two to 18 years with underlying medical conditions, and the incremental benefit of PCV20 use in children who completed the recommended PCV series with either, either PCV13 or PCV15. The work group is also reviewing evidence to revisit some of the conditions for risk-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendations. Here are the specific questions that are being considered by the work group. Are children with asthma at increased risk of pneumococcal disease regardless of oral, high dose oral corticosteroid use? Are children with chronic liver disease at increased risk of pneumococcal disease? Are children with chronic kidney disease at any stage at increased risk of pneumococcal disease? We'll look at each question in the next few slides. Currently, there are differences between the pediatric and adult recommendations regarding the indications for pneumococcal vaccine use for people with asthma. The current pediatric recommendation says including asthma if treated with high-dose oral corticosteroid therapy, whereas current adult recommendation includes asthma um, of any severity. Currently, there are certain conditions or risk factors that are part of adult risk-based recommendations, but not for the pediatric recommendations shown in the gray cells, uh, which are alcoholism, chronic liver disease, and cigarette smoking. So specifically, the work group is considering adding chronic liver disease as part of pediatric risk-based recommendations. And lastly, chronic renal failure has historically been interpreted as those on dialysis or about to be on dialysis. The work, is, the work group is, uh, is discussing whether the risk-based recommendation should be expanded to children with all CKD stages. The work group will work on the following as next steps. Review of evidence and work group interpretation of the remaining ETR domains values, acceptability, resource use, and feasibility. 
review findings from cost effectiveness analyses, and draft policy options for PCB20 use in US children for consideration by the committee. And um, uh, during the previous session, I, I feel I already got uh, good feedback, but here are questions from the com committee. Does the committee agree with the policy questions being considered by the work group? And are there additional data the committee would like to see before deciding on policy options for a vote? Thank you. Thank you. This presentation is open for questions. All right. Thank you. It sounds like some of the questions that were raised earlier, actually, you have already in your additional considerations, which I think will be um, very helpful. Um, and I'll just state that in terms of the policy questions that you had raised on slide two, if you can go back to those, um, yes. both of those to me seem like reasonable policy options. Uh, at, and specifically, that should PCB20 be rec recommended as an option um, until we can see some of the um, benefit, cost, cost effectiveness benefit risk assessment. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Dr. Lear. Um, I, I do want to just, the, the slide that struck me the most today is the incidence among children with immunocompromising conditions. I mean, 270 times, even if they've had vaccines, is just striking. And so that's just, I'll be really curious to see what extra data you get on that. And then a slightly off topic, but pneumococcal related issue. Um, a reminder that after the MMRW, MMWR is published, insurance companies have a year before they have to start covering the vaccines. And speaking as a private office, I still have some insurances which are not covering PCV15 for children. And it is, I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but I just find it frustrating that I have to wait until each insurance will cover. Um, and it's just, it delays care. So thank you for letting me share that. Dr. Sanchez. No, I just, I just wanted to agree. Um, and I think that you know, we're facing in pediatrics what we faced with the adult recommendations and the, you know, bringing on the PCV20 because um, it certainly sounds like a great idea, but certainly we need to see the cost efficacy and effectiveness. Um, and, um, and we're also having issues with getting PCV15 as well at our hospital. Um, we're still giving PCV13. As to the reason, I has not been, has escaped my, um, I have not been elucidated on why. <laughs> but it's, uh, we'll see what happens with this vaccine as well. But I think that it's very promising and certainly, um, and definitely as an alternative to the, um, to the pneumococcal 23 valent. Can I just clarify uh, to follow up on Dr. Sanchez's point? Because I saw in one of the slides the comparison was 13 or 15. But are, are you, is the work group proposing to have 13, 15, and 20 as options, or are we moving to a different set of options? So um, yes, you know, because the comparator is current recommendations, uh, that's why we have 13 and 15. But um, th this might be more appropriate for the representatives from Pfizer. But um, my sense is, you know, probably once PCV20 um, indication for children is granted, then eventually PCV13 will be uh, pulled for the market. Thank you for that clarification. I don't know if anyone from Pfizer can comment. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is Alejandro Cane. I am a U.S. A medical representative for vaccines and antiviral for Pfizer. What Miwako said is absolutely correct. Once PCV20 is approved for the pediatric indication, PCV13 will be phased out in the U.S. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Hoag. Thanks so much. I, I know that uh, my role here is primarily as liaison for the Pharmacists Association, but I work at Loma Linda University Health, a very large health system uh, with a very large children's hospital. 
and um, was recently visiting with uh, our chief of pediatrics and, and some of our pediatricians discussing their perspectives on pneumococcal vaccines. And um, I just want to reiterate something that I think Dr. Lear said earlier um, in that uh, it's frustrating, very frustrating that um, there's such a delay in coverage among private insurance for the uh, PCV15. Um, our, our physicians um, and other clinicians see uh, see that the, that they really want to give 15. They want to provide the broadest protection possible for our kids. And um, with, if you've got the wrong kind of insurance, unfortunately, they feel like they can't provide that coverage. And there was a delay in getting VFC vaccine as well. So that was problematic. I think now that's resolved. But um, I just would state uh, on the issue of uh, PCV20 or PCV15, I think most busy clinicians day in and day out are going to say 20 is more than 15. It provides greater protection and, uh, or, you know, for more serotypes, and therefore we're going to provide that vaccine preferentially in our clinics. I, I recognize this issue with serotype 3, but I believe that it's a very nuanced issue that most um, pediatricians and others who provide vaccines for kids are likely not gonna get nearly as deep in the weeds on that as we are. So I, I think we need to think a lot about the practicality of the recommend, recommendations uh, as we go through this as well. But I really appreciate the great work of the committee. It's uh, the great presentations today. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, are there any additional hands raised? No. Oh. No, thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to thank our pneumococcal presenters uh, for their excellent work today. Um, and we'll look around the table to see if there's any objections to closing today's meeting or adjourning for today. I see no objections, so um, today's meeting is adjourned, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8 a.m.